Today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon Cereal. More about them a little bit later. If you wanted to take a ship from New York to San Francisco in 1913, you'd have to travel over 13,000 miles down the eastern seaboard, around Cape Horn, and all the way back up on the other side. But take that journey in 1915, and it would have taken less than half the time, thanks, of course, to the global game changer known as the Panama Canal. But the Panama Canal has had a threat nipping at its heels ever since it was just a twinkle in Teddy Roosevelt's eye. That threat is the Nicaragua Canal, a competing waterway that at present remains entirely hypothetical, but it's not for lack of trying. As of now, the Nicaragua Canal has been mapped out, feasibility tested, and even attempted in a story that's just as much about political intrigue as it is about reshaping the world order. So let's jump in. The idea to construct a canal through Nicaragua is not a new one. For the majority of the time that northern nations have maintained a presence in Latin America, Nicaragua, not Panama, has been the main focus for a water route between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The concept gets its appeal for a couple of major reasons. The San Juan River runs a line through southeastern Nicaragua, although current borders mean that Nicaragua shares the river with Costa Rica. The river runs 190 miles, that's 192 kilometers, to Lake Nicaragua, from which a ship can navigate most of the way to the Pacific coast. From there, all that would need to be done would be to connect Lake Nicaragua to the Pacific. This geographic convenience made Nicaragua the main overland shipping route across the Americas before the Panama Canal was built, although ships would still have to be unloaded and goods or passengers would be transported by land for a small but highly inconvenient portion of the journey. The conquistadors of the Spanish Empire were the first to investigate the feasibility of a canal through Nicaragua in order to facilitate the trade of gold and slaves across the region, although given their limited technological means to make such a project happen, they were obviously not successful. Hello everybody, today's sponsor is of course Magic Spoon Cereal. And I'm gonna put this down before I spill it all over myself. Do you remember those lazy Saturday mornings as a kid when you'd sit down in front of the TV with your favorite bowl of cereal and some cartoons? Well, today I've got something for you that'll take you right back to that happy place. It's Magic Spoon Cereal with childhood upgraded for the 21st century consumer. These delicious cereals are never boring and are perfect for the adult and the inner child in all of us. And guess what? They're high in protein too. Got a box here. Look, it even says it right there. 13 grams of protein per serving. Plus, not very many net carbs. Zero grams of total sugars, which is nice. They're also gluten-free and grain-free. Beyond all of that, though, they're delicious. They're really very, like, it doesn't taste healthy. It tastes bad for you, which I think is a good, good thing, because things that are bad for you, like chocolate chip cookies, are, uh, are generally more delicious. <laughs> Plus, there's no cane sugar, corn syrup, sugar alcohols in here, not at all. I'm a big fan of the peanut butter flavor, although recently they sent me like 10 boxes of chocolate chip cookie. I'm not sure if it's a mistake, but the box just arrived and it was just this one flavor. And I'm like, okay, guys. The good news is it's absolutely delicious. Although maybe, you know, hook me up with some more peanut butter because I cannot get enough of that one. Build your own variety box with their amazing flavors. Their variety pack comes with four delicious flavors, cocoa fruited, frosted, and peanut butter. But you can also try it with blueberry muffin, cookies and cream, maple waffle flavors, plus honey nuts, that's another cracker, and cinnamon roll. And guess what? If you're in Canada or the UK, you can enjoy Magic Spoon too, in addition to Americans, because Americans get everything. <laughs> the cereal's just so good. So if you want to experience the joy of cereal again without all the added junk, go to magicspoon.com slash megaprojects and use my code megaprojects for $5 off your order today. And you know what's the best part? If you don't love it, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Just click the link below and make sure to try a variety pack of Magic Spoon today. And now back to today's video. A few centuries later, the Federal Republic of Central America commissioned surveyors to study a new route. American tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt proposed a similar project in order to facilitate travel for prospectors to California for the gold rush of the 1840s. But although Vanderbilt had the capital and relatively modern technology to give himself a reasonably decent shot, 
his efforts were frustrated by the American mercenary William Walker, who took over the Nicaraguan government in the 1850s. Around this time, the British Empire had also been considering a canal through Nicaragua, but both Vanderbilt and Queen Victoria effectively had their hopes dashed by Walker's attempt at manifest destiny. But by the early 1900s, the US Senate had decided that enough was enough, and it was about damn time that the pesky problem of the Central American land bridge was solved once and for all. The Senate was presented with two choices for a canal project, one that would run through Panama and another that would run through Nicaragua. And for a long, long time, the Nicaraguan Canal was a heavy favorite for lawmakers and builders alike. It was also low in elevation, which meant fewer locks would have to be built in order to raise and lower ships through sections of the canal. And at the time, they believed that Nicaragua was largely untouched by the tropical diseases that would have made the Panamanian jungles a death trap for a North American immune system. But after an intense lobbying campaign by supporters of the Panama proposal, plus some cheeky discounts on Panama's land, the US Congress decided against the option they're determined to make the most sense. I mean, how things change with lobbying and all that, right? <laughs> but even after the Panama Canal opened for business in 1914, it didn't completely negate the possibility of a canal in Nicaragua. In fact, interest in the project picked up again barely a decade after the Panama Canal was opened as it became increasingly clear that the Panama Canal was perhaps just a little bit too popular for its own good. High levels of trading vessels have been great for business and even better for traffic jams. A second canal could have been built at the time. The Great Depression and the Second World War made sure of that, uh, with volcanic activity in Nicaragua just reinforcing their hesitancy. But the demand for it was there, whether or not anybody had the ability to act on it. Over the following half century, the land would be surveyed intermittently, but nobody was really willing to pick up the tab for this project. But that all changed in 2006, when the government of Nicaragua announced a proposal to construct what they dubbed the Grand Interoceanic Nicaragua Canal. At a price of 20 billion American dollars, Nicaragua's plan was to get in on the Asian export market big time in a joint public and private plan that would build a route traveling through Lake Nicaragua. By this time, international interest in a new canal had only gone up. Many of the world's biggest shipping vessels are far too large to squeeze through the Panama Canal, which was definitely not designed with today's enormous ships in mind. The Nicaraguan proposal endeavored to solve that problem with a deeper draft for ships to pass through. The announcement was immediately met by resistance from some sources, not least of all the government of Panama, which had been in the middle of considerations on expanding their own canal to support the passage of larger vessels. As Panamanian authorities argued, there just wouldn't be enough traffic to justify a Nicaraguan canal, that is, not after the Panama Canal finished their upgrades, which would be sure to conclude far before Nicaragua could build a canal from scratch. But the Nicaraguan president at the time, Enrique Bolaños, disagreed. After all, the Panama Canal had plenty of other problems and only served a small portion of all ships that came to the Americas. Investors from Japan, China, and elsewhere had already shown interest in a potential project, and if the money could come through, Nicaragua was likely to throw its hat in the ring. The Nicaraguan government's opportunity would come on September the 26th, 2012, when Nicaragua and the aptly named Hong Kong Nicaragua Canal Development Group, or HKND, signed an agreement that committed HKND to financing and building the new canal. HKND was a newly formed organization with Chinese billionaire Wang Jing at the helm. Wang, who at the time was one of China's richest billionaires, was known even then for his close ties with China's ruling party. With his immense personal capital and connections thrown behind the development, it was clear that this canal was going to garner some major investments over time. When the Nicaraguan government and the HKND committed to the project, the price tag rested somewhere around $40 billion, with early estimates that it would take about five years to construct. The channel would be 90 feet deep at a minimum and 1,700 feet across at its widest point, making it more than able to provide passage to the world's biggest supertankers. This was especially relevant, because even though Panama had, by this time, approved their own expansion project, even the bigger and better version of the Panama Canal wouldn't have been enough to hold 
these particular ships. Along with the canal itself, HKND was granted sole rights to developing ports and international airport and other developments to support the canal with a 50-year agreement that could be renewed for the following 50 years. HKND set to work assessing feasibility for their ideal canal route and produced optimistic assessments. A broad increase in maritime trade would produce more than enough demand to support a second Trans-American Canal while also reducing strain on the Suez Canal, the Malacca Strait, and various rail lines. It would also make it more lucrative to build larger so-called post-Panamax ships, that is, ships that are greater than the maximum allowable size in the Panama Canal. Unsurprisingly, the Nicaraguan legislature approved the project, with Nicaragua's current president, Daniel Ortega, and HKND's chairman Wang finalizing the agreement in late 2014. But just as soon as the rights were given over to HKND, international critics began to raise eyebrows at just what that agreement had contained. Not only was it remarkably devoid on details of how exactly the canal would be financed, but it also didn't specify a route for the canal. That could be overlooked, of course. Maybe the involved parties just didn't feel like taking an educated guess without some verification studies. But the bigger issue was in the wording of the contract itself, which technically set up a situation in which Wang and HKND could avoid making any payments to Nicaragua, avoid building a canal at all, and start operating other tangentially related projects instead free of tax. Wang claimed to have found all of the foreign investors he needed, and HKND did end up submitting a route proposal despite public skepticism. Their chosen route would run from the mouth of Brito River, which empties into the Pacific Ocean, before rising to access Lake Nicaragua, traveling through the lake, and then down the Punta Gorda River to the Caribbean Sea. It would also include developing a second artificial lake of 150 square miles, which would pool enough water to fill the canal's locks without having to pull water from the supply of Lake Nicaragua. But this is about the time that the Nicaraguan Canal, already somewhat politicized in nature, started to get a lot more contentious from a geopolitical perspective. Nicaragua's president, Daniel Ortega, is a former guerrilla leader currently serving his second stint in office, uh, which he's held continuously since 2007. Just to give you some perspective on who we're dealing with here, a UN inquiry released in early 2023 described his regime's human rights abuses as being comparable to Nazi Germany. Now, we mentioned this partly because it's an objectively important thing to be aware of, and also because it helps to explain some of the statements he made about the canal around this time, calling it a second phase of the Nicaraguan revolution and touting its ability to add a quarter million jobs to the Nicaraguan economy. Right out of the gate, even HKND disputed this number, estimating about a fifth of the job growth, with a number of those jobs going to Chinese workers. But that certainly didn't stop Ortega from shouting out his own ideas about the canal's potential uh, when it came time for an election cycle. Internationally, the Nicaragua Grand Canal became a lightning rod for criticism, pretty much all of which was quite well founded. Many of the concerns critics brought up were related to Wang Jing's minimal prior experience in large-scale construction work, while others focused on the highly implausible claims that the canal could be completed in five years' time. Both criticisms were made more salient by the specific demands of the project. Over 2,000 pieces of heavy equipment, 4 billion liters of diesel fuel, 400,000 tons of explosives, and a lot, lot more, none of which was in Nicaragua at that time, and all of which would have to be operated in heavy, frequent rains that could easily wash dug up dirt back into the canal at high volumes. Another layer of complication came from Nicaragua's active volcanoes, particularly the Concepcion volcano, uh, which is in Lake Nicaragua, along the route where the ships would travel. The canal route also lies on a major hurricane belt, in a country where hurricanes have caused mass casualty events in the past. And beyond the geologic fears were financial ones. As the project wore on, any funds HKND was able to accumulate weren't announced to the public, and the firm hadn't even started digging by September of 2015, which was obviously cutting it very, very close to that five-year deadline. But if that's not enough, we do have the ability to make this situation yet another layer more discouraging due to statements from shipping giants like Maersk, who indicated that they actually might not need to run their extra-large ships through a trans-American canal at all, especially because the United States, the biggest shipping destination in the hemisphere, doesn't have the facilities that could fit those ships in the first place. But even with that, we still have additional layers of complications to discuss. Like any large-scale engineering project, the Nicaragua 
Nicaragua Canal had to take climate change into account. But in Nicaragua, rising sea levels didn't just mean potential issues with water flow. Instead, climate change brought a very real possibility that ships could pass through new shipping routes in the Arctic, eliminating the need for a canal entirely. And as long as we're discussing environmental factors, we can touch on the fact that Lake Nicaragua, the centerpiece of the project, is also Nicaragua's main source of drinking water. A canal would cause a whole lot of ship fuel to spew into that water, while the required digging on the lake floor risk churning up huge amounts of toxins from the silt below. The chosen path for the canal also ran through a number of nature reserves and wildlife sanctuaries, while interrupting migratory routes and territories for various animal species. Now, none of this seemed to give the Nicaraguan government any cause for concern, but the people of Nicaragua were another matter entirely. The project was faced by large-scale internal protests, a rare and dangerous occurrence in Nicaragua given the government's predisposition to sweeping harsh repressive measures. The protests brought up additional points of concern, including forced eviction and land seizure, some of which was against indigenous peoples along the canal route. Other protesters explained that the public was skeptical that HKND would even stick with the project, setting up a situation where Nicaragua's environment and society was rocked by the development but didn't even get a canal for its trouble. It's worth noting that even in 2015, amidst these concerns, only 17% of Nicaraguan citizens reported being against the canal, while 41% of the population was strongly in support. But it's equally important to note that these results must be heard with the Ortega regime's ongoing practices of political repression firmly in mind. With such a mountain of reasons not to go forward with the project, and a strong possibility that the entire endeavor was corrupt from the start, it's probably for the best that reports in 2015 began to announce that the project was going to be delayed and maybe even cancelled. The collapse of the stock markets in China had tanked Jing Wang's personal wealth, and the Nicaraguan government appeared to take the opportunity to quietly back off of their campaign over the canal, at least in the short term. By 2016, the project appeared to be stalled almost completely, with only minimal updates going out since then about what exactly Nicaragua's and HKND's plan was. In fact, although the Nicaraguan government has been about as opaque as we would expect under the circumstances, most international analysts have assessed that the entire initiative had died out by 2018. China's business infrastructure beyond Wang Jing showed no desire to provide a cash influx, and opposition leaders have condemned the entire thing as a scam against the people of Nicaragua. Although it's still unclear what precisely the Ortega regime's goal was in the project, it's looking more and more certain that it was a facet of the regime's broader attempts to accumulate its own wealth. As of now, HKND maintains rights to their original agreement, and there's little to suggest that the Ortega regime is going to do anything about that either. As time goes on, there may be yet more resurgent interest in the Nicaraguan Canal, especially as China begins to forge close ties with Nicaragua and other parts of Latin America. Although the Panama Canal operates under the Panamanian government, the United States still commands a sturdy majority of its shipping traffic and is allowed by treaty to enforce what it perceives to be threats to the canal's neutrality. With tensions rising between the US and China over a number of flashpoints around Latin America, it may make very good sense for China to invest in a canal that the United States has less of a say in regulating. For his part, Wang Jing has made sure to stay in touch with the Nicaraguan government. In late 2021, he publicly congratulated Daniel Ortega on winning a fourth term as president in an election that was condemned internationally for its lack of legitimacy. In 2019, the US Treasury Department released a statement indicating that members of Ortega's family are actively laundering money through HKND, so so perhaps that's why Wang and the Ortegas have chosen to keep in touch. Regardless, Wang's continued presence suggests that the diplomatic possibility of a canal is not completely off the table. Ortega has also been doing his part. In September 2022, he reiterated the need for a Nicaraguan canal and announced that he planned to explore a revival of the project in the coming years. A Nicaraguan canal would certainly fit neatly in with China's International Belt and Road Initiative and put Nicaragua on the hook with the same sort of debt that China has begun to accrue in other less developed nations globally, a sort of economic carrot and stick approach to building hegemony. Granted, China could also commit to a diplomatic standoff with the United States over the Panama Canal, but an alternative route, especially under a regime that has had its differences with the US become increasingly intractable, might end up being the more appealing option for both China and Nicaragua.